Hello, and welcome to a new series called All You Need. I'm Dr. Abstract, and in this case, it's all you need to make HTML5 games. We're going to make an isometric board game together, and it's a tutorial, so we'll take you through all the steps, and this is for anybody. I hope you have fun. All right, let's, um, let's go take a look at the game that we're going to be making. Welcome, clever traveler. All right, we press that, and there's our traveler. And we have these lanterns, and if we walk to the lantern, doop, 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 we can reveal a colored orb. Oh, yellow. Yellow is the very last one, though. So we want to get them in order. In other words, the pink one first. Let's go see what this one is. Bum, bum, bum. And the player needs to be next to, around the lantern before they can reveal. I can't reveal. Oh, I can't reveal these ones if I press. But uh, what color was that? Blue. Okay, so what the yellow and blue. It would help to sort of remember what we've got, yellow and blue. When we come to this one, ah, that's it. So the next one we want is green. Um, well, maybe it'll be this one. We haven't seen green yet. No, it's not. Okay. So that means they'll clo it'll close. And if we come back here, uh, we can get this one. Yay. And now we have to, presumably this one is green. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh Oh, I think that one was red, but pretend we couldn't remember. I, I, I don't know. So we're trying to get them in order. We got the pink one. We got the green one. And this one is red. Oh, we needed blue. So all those other ones closed again. Now we have to start over again. There's a timer going, and we're trying to get the lowest time to reveal all of the orbs in the right color. Yay! So this is an isometric game. It's made in Zim, and Zim is a JavaScript canvas framework, and let's just drop this down. F11, uh, here is Zim, right here, zimjs.com, and it is good for coding creativity. We can make art and games. It's got all sorts of components, which is handy for games and these other things. Uh, one thing nice, if you've made games in something else like uh, Phaser, Pixie, Zim is coming in, less code. It's nice and simple. We think you'll really like it. All right, so we're going to be following a tutorial right here. Make HTML5 games. This is out on Medium by Dr. Abstract. That's me. And we'll, we'll put the link to this in the video as well. And this is where we can grab our code from. The code in preparation, the code is also in the Zim editor, so there, there are links to that. Uh, this is a simplified version of it, uh, although the, the full version is there in the editor as well. But this is a simplified version. You might want to take a look at that and just have a read through. It does have the pathfinding in it. You don't really need to know too much about the pathfinding code. We'll just sort of grab it and paste it in. Um, the other code's pretty easy to read. Hey, make a new board, make a player, make a tree and uh, you know, put them on the board, that kind of thing. Uh, there will be some logic with respect to the lanterns and so forth, so you know we'll go through that. We have then a choice to use the online editor, the Zim editor there, or we can use a desktop editor like VS Code, and we'll be doing the tutorial in VS Code, and would suggest that you do the same as well, and we'll tell you a bit about the differences as we go. All right, so we're going to go and grab a code uh, or a template uh, for VS Code, and that's out on the Zim site here. And we go code, like so. And right here, there's the code, and we hit copy. And, and we're going to copy that, and we'll come back into VS Code. So this is VS Code. There was a link to it in the tutorial page. It's by editor. Most people are using VS Code these days. And we're going to paste the code into a file called ISO for isometric, iso.html. So in VS Code, you would make a new file, or if you have a folder for it, you can make a new file here, new file, and call it iso.html, and we've pasted in the template. Woohoo! So the differences between the editor, this is the, the Zim template, the editor is only this code right here. So for instance, if we went to the editor, uh, well, let's take a look at it and see what this looks like. If I save it, I have a component, or sorry, a uh, extension called open in default browser. So if I open in a default browser here, this is what the code looks like. Zim code creativity. It's got what's called a stage. That's this light area and a dark area is outside of Zim. This is the fit mode in that stage. 
uh, will fit in your browser window. Okay, so that's that's our code there. I'll just take that off and I'll show you the fit mode. There we go. Okay, so as we change the browser size like that, it kind of fits inside the browser window and we can still drag that code along. All right, um, where were we then? We were back over here. Uh, yeah, I have an extension to view that, although you can go find it in your folder and drop it in a browser. The extensions are right here, and you can do a search for open in browser. Uh, where's my open in browser? Open in browser right there. So open in browser, there's also a live server. Both of those will allow you to do previews by right clicking and saying open in default browser or open in live server. Live server might be handy for later when we go to load images, and we'll, but we'll get to that when we bring in our assets. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's right. I was saying that there's our circle. If I copy this code right here and we go back to the browser window, uh, here is, that's where we copied our template from. If I go back to the editor like this, I'm going to clear the editor, yes, and paste inside of there. So you see what we've done. We've taken the code that was in the template and put it in the editor and I test and there's my, my purple circle. So basically the editor already has the template built in. Think of it as being up here and then it ends the template down here. And we're just coding in that little bit. So you're welcome to use the editor uh, and any differences will sort of tell you as you go along. So you can code right in here if you want and you don't even need to get VS Code. But uh, the professionals will get VS Code and use that to make your game. Uh, and here we are. So this is the stuff that would be in the editor. This is already built into the editor, okay, including the end of the ready. However, we don't need a circle, so we'll get rid of that. And if we get rid of that and save it and come back here and do a refresh, uh, the circle's gone. So this part here is called the stage. It's what we see in our game. And that, that came from, well, it came from Director, a Macromedia Director, which later became Adobe Director, which then got sort of replaced by Adobe Flash, and uh, now Flash has been replaced by the canvas. Uh, that's, and here we are. So Zim is very similar to what we were doing building in Flash, and uh, it's quite marvelous. All right, so there's our stage, and we might want to make some changes, but why, why don't we follow along in the tutorial? That makes it a little bit easier. I can see right away we want, might want to change that to a black background in the stage there. Uh, but we'll uh, take a look and see if that's what we did in our tutorial. So here's the tutorial. We were just talking about the template and how to save. So all those steps uh, that we may have gone through quickly. Most people know how to save files, but if, you, if you're not quite there yet, you can read through the steps. <laughs> and, and there's the steps for the, uh, the, the um, components or whatever, plugins, what the heck are they called, extensions. All right, and a bit be about the difference between the editor. So here we are in making the game. Yay! All right, to make the game, we're going to bring in the Zim code. In the editor, we've already got it, but you'd have to check game right there. You see that? But if we're in VS Code, which we are, we're going to copy this. Well, it's basically we add underscore game in there to grab the game. Let's do that now. We won't see any difference. That's bringing in Zim, all of the Zim code. What we want is to bring in the game module. And that uh, the game module's extra code that has the isometric board. It's also got, well, um, uh, it's got the orbs, it's got the trees, it's got a leaderboard if you want a leaderboard, etc. All right, so there, we've just brought in the game module. Good, and like I said, if you were out on the Zim editor, and then you would check the game thing there. So here we are bringing in the board itself, an isometric board. I'm going to copy that. And come back here. So we're in the put your code here part. Const board is equal to a new board. If we didn't have the game, it wouldn't know what the board is because that comes from the game module. And then we're going to center that on the stage. Now let's have a look. There we have a new isometric board 
on the stage. So you can see that it's not going to be all that hard, is it? <laughs> Did you think we had to build the isometric board already? <laughs> all right, so that, that comes with, with Zoom, which is handy. And anything else? Any, any questions so far? <laughs> there we go. So if you wanted to make some other object in, in Zoom, for instance, uh, we could put a button right on top there, a new button like this, and there's a new button dot center. And that's one way to do it if you want to center it. And now if we take a look here, we have a, a new button that has been centered uh, there. But we might want to put the board somewhere else. And we're going to be seeing the, these types of things as we go through. We're going to be putting the orb colors down in the bottom right. We'll put a, a, a title up in the top left and a timer over here on the right. Okay, and there's other ways to position things other than center them. There we go. All right, back to our steps. Hopefully you're doing well. Here are the parameters for the board. There's lots of parameters and this is all available in the docs. So if I press on that, we've just gone out to the docs and there's the parameters right there. Here's a description of the board, an example, and then what all the parameters do. So those parameters, but there's a whole bunch of methods. Look at all those methods, blah, 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 blah. So lots of things that we can do with the board. And then here's all the properties of the board that we would tend to use, plus the events when things happen. Uh, oh, sorry, the events when things happen right here. Okay, we're also going to be using a person. There's a person right there. We can specify things about the person and the orbs and a tree and a timer, as a matter of fact. There's also a score, a dialog box that comes in there and we may have bypassed one up above here. It starts off with a leaderboard and a meter. So the, that's what's in the game module there. And then this is the docs where there's, you know, everything in Zim is inside the docs here. Okay, and those just open and close like that. All right, so um, we're also going to be bringing in some assets. So assets are pictures, and we used Midjourney to make some isometric as assets. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we bring in the picture, though. This is pointing to the simple example again that you can take a look at. And then our asset strategy is rather than bring in the pictures and make the pictures at the beginning and talk about them at the beginning, usually when you build something, it makes more sense to well plan it out with a uh, on pet paper um, that's called like a wireframe diagram or sketch it out what you're what you're hoping to make but then rather than make all the assets to start you should code the game first because the game may change as you code and or you may not even make the game and then you would have wasted all that time making the assets so generally we can make our assets and bring in our assets at the end and as we code, we can use sort of placeholders, easy things. Uh, for instance, as we begin here, we're going to just use the Zim uh, person, which is a right there, person, a new person. And trees, well, actually, we ended up using the trees, didn't we? <laughs> but we don't have to. So we're going to be using fake assets. So let's, let's go. Let's add the board. Well, we added the board. We've also changed the background color to gray and the indicator uh, border color to light. That's the circles. So if we have a dark background of the board, then we might want those path circles as, as you're sort of um, uh, getting a path for showing. Uh, you want those to be light. So there we are setting those parameters on the board. One thing to note here, and we talk about it right here, is Zim has two ways to do parameters, and it was invented in Zim Duo. So our Zim 1 was Zim 1, Zim Duo, Zim Tri, Zim 4, Zim V, etc. Um, so that's version 2 of Zim, and we call it the Zim Duo technique, where we can pass in normal parameters. So here's a frame with normal parameters, where we don't really say the parameter names, we just put the values in order or you can pass in a configuration object. And here's a configuration object right here that starts with the squiggly brackets, a single parameter, configuration objects with the name of the parameter and its value. Then the order doesn't matter and you don't have to put them all. Okay, so that's a Zim Duo technique. And so uh, we could make the board by putting in the parameters in order, but we wanna to get to an indicator border color, which is much later on. And this makes it easier to do that. So I'm going to copy this code right here and bring it in to VS Code. Or you would put it into the 
And if this happens, so as I copy it, it's out of format. You can probably say format document like that, and that would uh, do the formatting for you. Okay, so I right clicked and said format document, or there's a hotkey. So const board, I've got two boards already. Okay, right, we already had a board. We basically were making some changes to the board that we already had, and there they are right there. All right, so that will make our board dark, and we won't see the indicator circles yet until we do the path, uh, which happens later. Here we are making a player, and in this case, we're making a new person. That comes from the game module. In the end, we'll make this a picture of our of our isometric guy. There we are adding the player to the board at position three zero. We're also adding a new tree at four and three, five and seven, zero and five, five and zero. So if I save this and take a look over here, so what we had before and refresh, now we've got our player at that location. And we've got our trees. So what we've done with the trees is we made the trees here a little bit transparent. ALP stands for alpha. And that way we can see through them to kind of see the squares that are in behind. That's optional. You don't have to do that. These trees, you don't really need to do that, though, because we don't need to see behind those trees. Okay, and so there we are setting the ALP to 0.8. That's called chaining. And we can chain. We've got these short little chainables for all sorts of things, for the loc of something, for the alp, for the alphas, for the scale, we use ska, for the rotation, we use rote, uh, etc. And so we'll see these as we go along. Um, and it's one really handy thing with Zim that makes it use less code than other frameworks libraries. Okay, so we've added, as a matter of fact, the add probably chains on, we could probably changed, chained all of that and just said, add this, add that, add that, add that. Would that be fun to try? Do you want to do it? Should have thought of that. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, when we um, drop it down, we'll probably drop it down like that. So board dot add that. Board dot add this. If we if we do that, we wouldn't do any of these uh, things on the back here. And uh, let's see. Can multiple select that. Okay, something like that. And we refresh here. And it's still uh, the same. The player, by the way, every time we refresh, the player might be wearing different clothes. You, uh, we don't, we're not really caring about this player, but if you wanted to, you could specify <laughs> the, the colors there. Anyway, that's chaining, and for that to happen, the add method needs to return the object that it's on, so board. Therefore, the next add method could do that. Uh, anyway, why don't we leave that how it was, just because it matches, but um, maybe I'll go and adjust. I don't know. Whatever. Okay. Great, we got some stuff on the board. And by the way, right now, I think, oh no, the player's not moving yet. So we have to add some keys to make the player move with the keys. And eventually we'll get the pathfinding in there as well. Okay, what's the next step? Bum, 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 bum. There, by the way, are the positions. So we're starting at zero, zero up in the top, zero, one, two, three in the X, I guess we could call it. 0, 1, 2, 3, and then if this is the Y, it's at 0. This one's at 5 over and 0, whereas this one is 0, and then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 right here. So that's your coordinate system. Colors. All right, we're going to change our frame color to black, or if you were in the editor, you would add that code right up at the top right there, because the editor already has the frame made, therefore we can't go into the frame call and change it, but you can set the color of the frame after afterwards. So black. This is the color of the stage. This is the outer color. All right, so if we go back here, uh, let's go here, come on up, and instead of light, that's a Zim color. By the way, light and dark are Zim colors. If they don't have quotes around them, they're they're built into Zim. So things like gray as well as there, and red and orange and blue, etc. Those will all be Zim color blues. However, you can go to HTML colors anytime. So pink, if this is the Zim pink, if you want the HTML pink, put quotes around it. And you can also use uh, the pound sign and 22000 or whatever, you know. So whatever colors you want there. We want black, black. 
All right, and that puts uh, that makes this thing black like so around there. If we wanted to, we could set the color of the outer color as well to something different. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't mind it darker maybe. So uh, we've got dark and darker. Dark is very close to black, so it's one 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 basically. Black is zero zero zero. And all right, there we go. So that's the those colors. Uh, what else are we doing? Put zoo. Mm, the color of the orbs. So we're going to be randomizing the orb colors. Uh, let's. Why don't we copy this so we can look at it in the editor? And I'll talk about it in the editor and tell you what we're uh, saying right up there. I'm just wondering. I'm copying this. What does that do? What is that thing. Oh, private note. Okay, never mind. Don't want to make a private note. I was wondering if that was a copy. It doesn't look like a copy, but might have been nice. And we come back here, and after our board, we paste. Again, that pasted in. I could probably just tab it. But even so, if we tabbed it, uh, other things are kind of messing up on us. So I'm going to set hit format document, and that's a little bit better for us. All right, so we've got, these are the colors that we want for the orb. And when we do, we're gonna make a tile right here. Here's the tile. We're going to tile a new circle. And those circles will be 20 in radius. And then here's the color of the circle. If we just tiled red, for instance, we would see the following. A bunch, we tiled red circles. Okay, see that? So, hey, great, we tiled a bunch of red circles, five of them five columns, one row, with a spacing in the H of 10. And we don't care about spacing in the V. So that's us making a tile. Great. But they're all red. So the question is, is how do we tile these colors? Hmm. Normally, you'd be stuck. You couldn't do that. You would have to make the tile and it would tile the red things. And then afterwards, maybe you could loop through those and change the colors of them or something like that. Well, in Zim, we realized that that was a problem, and we made these things called dynamic parameters. And those were invented in Zim V, uh, which is the fifth version of Zim, so we call them Zim V values. Dynamic parameters let you pick, in a sense. So if we put in a random stuff here, so if we said red, comma, uh, blue, comma, <laughs> i got to get my fingers going, pink, all right, so we save that up. What will happen is it will randomly pick from this array and you get the following. Okay, every time I refresh, it's randomly picking from that array. If we want them in order, then we make a series of them. So I could say instead of those, I could say a series right here. And now it'll go red, blue, pink, red, blue, pink, red, blue, pink. Red, blue, pink, red, blue, etc. All right. So now we know the order of those. And we've already made the series up here. So we're making a series from that. But we don't always want it to be pink, red, blue, yellow, green. So we're shuffling the series. There's a couple different methods you can throw on the end of that to do different things. You can make it bounce back and forth. You can put it in reverse. You can shuffle. You can do what's called a mix and uh, even a random, I think, on it. And those all are slightly different. But in this case, a shuffle is just fine. All right, it's basically scrambling those. And therefore, when we say, OK, instead of that series right there, we're going to put in the correct colors right here. So we're sending into every time a circle gets made, it will do the next thing in the series. Yay! So now we get pink, green. So those are all the colors in that order. And if I refresh again, oh, could you tell? <laughs> Let me refresh again. There's pink. <laughs> Each time it's been pink to start. Doesn't always start with pink, I swear. It's just three times in a row. It did. Okay, there's one starting with red. Anyway, that's that's us getting a series down there. Isn't that handy? Okay, so. Uh, that those are our correct colors. We've got our tile, and we're calling our tile the target for the target colors. We're positioning it. Remember how we talked about there's different ways to position? We saw centering right there. Here is pose. This is posing it 40 pixels, 40 pixels from the right, from the bottom. And that's why it's 40 pixels over and 40 pixels up. 40 pixels from the right and 40 pixels from the bottom. 
So that makes us that uh, those things right there. Then we're taking a label and we have the words to pass, reveal the orbs in this order, uh, size of 40. We don't have any font specified. We'll bring in fonts later, custom fonts later, and the color will be purple. We're going to locate that and locate locates the registration point. So the, that's the top left-hand corner of the text at this point. And locate is, you know, we'd have to eyeball it. And obviously I don't know if I would have got, guessed that first. So we have a technique called place right there. And I'll show you what that does. So if I refresh now with the place on, you see how I can pick that up now, like so? And if I like it right here, then I go F12. And in the console, it tells me where that is currently located. So that's why I use loc in this case is because I wanted to pick this up and kind of put it carefully, sort of saying, yeah, there's where I like it. And there's the values right there, 67 by 688. And I have chosen instead of 67, 70 and 688 and 690. I kind of rounded up so it looked nicer. And it seems fine. <laughs> All right, so uh, commenting out the, uh, so for that, we'll just end that there and comment out the place and leave that there for you to remind you. Sometimes when we make things with place, we just leave it in there like that to tell people, ah, we use place to place that. Okay, and there we go. We also have a grid and a guide system. So there's a whole grid that you can overlay and that's how we started placing things. We don't have a visual editor. So that's how we started figuring things out with grid and guide. But then we thought place would be kind of cool and we did that and it's simpler. So we tend to use place uh, more so than create a grid or a guide there. All right, uh, grids and guides are still useful when doing some responsive layouts and stuff like that uh, with the layout class and we use it then, but, but otherwise we're placing. Because at that point you're placing with percentages of the stage width, the stage height, and things. All right, so back to our steps. Lanterns. We want the lanterns to hold the colors. All right, good. We did the shuffling. We did. Oh, uh, this is the lantern code. Okay, let's talk about the lantern code once we bring it in. So we'll copy that, and we're going to end up making some lanterns that just look like little rectangles for now instead of the lantern pictures. I'm going to copy that code and sticker in to here and do a format document. There we go. So here's our lanterns. Um, we're using the correct colors, but the correct colors is a series. So that series isn't an array. Uh, however, it has an array property. So we're using the array property there to grab the array from the correct colors and we're using the zim shuffle. So that's a shuffle a global function that will shuffle that array for us. Um, and that won't matter. We've already used the series, so we don't have to affect the array. Otherwise, we could copy the array, copy that, and that would make a copy of the array and use that. Anyway, uh, I think we're fine shuffling it. Here are our colors. These are now the shuffled colors of our previously shuffled colors because <laughs> we don't want them to be in the same order <laughs> as those shuffled colors, do we? Uh, otherwise, it would be quite easy to um, figure out the, the colors in order. So we need to reshuffle them, which we've done. And we've also made a positions array that is sort of saying where we are going to position these lanterns on the board. Often data like this can be done with tile mapping. And we mentioned this down below because we're going to put a whole bunch of walls on there. So why don't we leave it until the walls and then we'll talk about um, uh, tile maps and stuff like that. Okay. But anyway, those are the positions that we're going to have. Now we're using a Zim loop to loop through the colors. Colors is our uh, reshuffled array of colors. Each time we're going to get a color and we're also going to get an index number. Zim loop you'll find is very handy. Uh, there's, we can loop through containers of things in a, a similar manner. We can loop through a number of things. So it's sort of like a multi-purpose loop. Actually, in this one as well, we're going to loop through the, all the correct orbs. If we get one wrong, we're going to loop through all of the, the previously correct orbs and turn them off. And we're going to do that with an interval. So loop also has a possibility of an interval built right in so that you don't have to loop every time right away, you can loop over time, basically as well. 
All right, so inside here, we're making our rectangle. That's what it will look like. That's the cover we're calling it. And we're going to make a lantern as a container. And the, the basically the container will hold the cover and uh, then we'll swap it with an orb. So that way we get a single object called a lantern that might have in it a container or an orb. And that just makes it handy. Uh, all right, so we've got a lantern that is a new container. A container is an invisible holder of things. It's like a div in HTML. Uh, <laughs> but we've had them for a long time as well. Uh, before we had divs, I think. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, back in Director and Flash, we had uh, containers as well. Uh, it just helps. Okay, so, uh, by the way, the canvas, the raw canvas, doesn't have a container. And that's one of the things that... CreateJS came along and built containers for us as well as events. And then Zim is built on top of CreateJS. Uh, that's how it goes. All right, so here is the container and it's going to be the same width as our cover. And eventually we're gonna replace this rectangle with a picture. Then we are taking the cover and adding it to the lantern. And we're also centering the registration point of the lantern in the X, so that's in the middle, and bringing it down a bit in the height. And what that does is it will position this lantern better, not, not at the moment, at the moment it's still a little bit awkward. It positions it a little bit better on the isometric board, the registration there. The, uh, that Those numbers actually are perfect for the actual picture of the lantern. And what we did then is we uh, kind of reversed engineered and just added a rectangle. So you'll see when we put the picture in that that will be in the right place. Anyway, and we scaled the whole lantern. We have set a property of the cover to be the cover. So the lantern's cover now represents the cover rectangle. And we also have a property of the lantern called orb, which is, dum dum dum, a new orb that has this width and, oh, is the color. So this is important right here. So each orb that we make, as we loop through, each orb that we make in these places will have whatever the color is from our shuffled color array, colors at i. So i is our index as we loop through, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then we're grabbing the color at that index. However, we're not actually adding the orb to the uh, container at the moment. We could if and that could be put behind the lander, but we don't really need to. So when we press on it, we're just going to remove one and show the other. They don't both need to be in there at the moment. We don't see the orbs. Okay, uh, we're getting the position. So now we're this is us actually positioning on the board the lantern. So uh, we're grabbing the position at I at zero. So this is when I is zero, it, I at zero is this one, at zero would be one, at one would be one. <laughs> and then we put that lantern, add it to the board at that, and we're giving it some data. Let's come back to that in just a sec. The next time we go through when I is one, zero, one, when I is one, one, we'll grab this array right here and we grab the five and we grab the two. So isn't that fun? It's just array access programming basic stuff. If you haven't programmed ever before, uh, that's some of the fun things to do with programming. You'll get used to arrays. How you're getting things at an index. And remember those indexes always start at zero, not at one. Okay, so anyway, that's positioning each of those boards in our, or sorry, each of those lanterns on the board in our loop. For the data here, this can be any data that we want. We could throw in an array of data, an object literal of data. We could put a string that says uh, lantern on it, lantern, that would have been fine too. What we've done is said, if it's a lantern, we're giving it some data of one. Uh, that could also be one like that, but uh, we'll keep it as a string for now. Okay. The default data is that X. So if you don't have anything on a board, it gets default data of X, not a default data of nothing, a default data of X. And so all the other squares at the moment, other than the lanterns, will have a default of X, but the lanterns will have one. And you're going to see that we use this later with our pathfinding. We basically say for pathfinding, sorry, you can't go on uh, one square. 
we could have said you could only go on an x square or we can say what you can't go on. So you can either say which squares to go on or which squares that we can't go on. These are these filters that we'll see later. Okay, good. Um, so now we have our lanterns. Shall we see? Let's save her up here and do a refresh over here. Oop, I'm looking for it. Lost it. There it is. Refresh. Okay, there's our lanterns in the right positions. We don't have any pathfinding yet, so we can't tell if, if that works yet, but we've got our lantern, surrogate lanterns, call it. Good. Okay, so what's next? Yeah, how are we doing? How are you guys doing? Anytime you want. We're, we're sitting at half an hour, roughly. Uh, anytime you want, you're welcome to go grab a cookie. You know, pause it, obviously. Pause it, grab a cookie, drink a water. I'm going to just have a drink here. That's good. Half an hour of talking. Yeah, I'm used to it, though. All right, coming on down here, we are now going to put in the walls. So the walls were making a, a different color, a, a colored square. But you could put in uh, an item for the wall, like a picture of a wall as well. And here's this ISO example. That was the sort of, uh, I don't know, main example for the isometric board when we first made this board oh, about eight years ago, something like that. And this example has ways to change the color. So it's got two modes, color and move. So if you're in the color mode, when you choose a color here, you can change the color of any of the squares by clicking on it. And then, by the way, you can clear it, uh, but you can also hit record. And record will show you that it's very easy to record the data that is in the board. And as a matter of fact, that will also record things like the trees and where the person is and any any icons that you put on there or any items. So there's items, icons. Icons go underneath on the, on the board itself. Uh, items go sort of stand up. So the tree and the person's an item. You could change the picture of the tile and that's called the icon of the tile. You can also change the color of the tile. You can give the tile info and you can give the tile data. So those are uh, all of the things that you can give and filter out what's happening with the board. So it's quite um, sort of a multi-level thing. Also notice the board, this board has arrows. So that means you can move the board along. So if I move the arrow up like that, the whole board moves down and it kind of the, the parts all move with it. And so you can, it's called the camera. You can see a different part of the board. Uh, this one is a score over here, isometric. This one's a timer, so you could do that. And uh, in recording, it's like you've made a tile map. You've basically made a tool that will say that these are different terrains. And if you record it, and you can bring it in, take all that data that you recorded, and start the game that way. And therefore, your game would have all these colors. The neat thing with the pathfinding as well is these colors can have numbers based on them. And therefore, you can uh, say that the green is really easy to traverse. The gray is neutral, the orange is harder, the red is really hard, and the dark gray is a wall. You can't go through it. And your pathfinding, look at what we've done. The pathfinding should normally just go straight from here to the orb. But it doesn't do that because these are harder to, to walk on. They're different terrains. This might be sand and uh, that's water or something and green is easy so it calculates the pathfinding and goes the easiest or best path isn't that cool and if i went to this square right here it doesn't even go over here it goes right around like it comes onto the green and comes around and goes like that and comes to this square so that's kind of cool to see and all of that is uh you can check it out at the iso example if you so desire Okay, so here's the walls. In other words, this data could have been recorded uh, in a system like this, or even this very system right here, if you wanted to, and hit the record, and you would get this data right here rather than uh, try and figure it out by calculating. <laughs> okay, uh, I think there was a way, I can't remember if we built it in, but there was also a way to put the little numbers on the step so that you could easily look at the thing and see, oh, this is four or five or whatever it is, five, four. Uh, you can do that manually too with some code. Okay, for now we're going to have the data. Let's grab this and see what's uh, happening. And we'll come back in here, move this back over here. And we're not inside our loop. Right here, right click and format document. 
Okay, so there's our wall data. And then we loop through that wall data. Loop through walls each time we're given a point. So every time we loop through walls, we, we get what's in the array. And we are going to get the tile at that point, point zero and point one. So uh, it'll be two zero, that is board.getTile. Then we're setting the color of the tile to dark, and we're setting the data of the tile to zero. So zero means we're not gonna walk on it. One means it's a light. Now, we're actually not gonna walk on one either. <laughs> there it is, let's try her out. And we come back here and we should see a bunch of dark paths now. Well, those aren't the paths. So these are the walls. Note that we've actually put walls everywhere. There's a tree as well. So we don't have to worry about walking through the tree because a wall is there, the zero is there. And there's our characters. So now you can see that, hey, we got a path kind of going through our, our dungeon or our park or whatever we got here. <laughs> it's a dungeon with trees. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so what's next one? Come on down here. The keyboard movement, all right. So we cannot use keys until the user interacts with the canvas. So usually we have a message at the start and the user presses that and that counts as an interaction. So we have a, a greeting message to start and when they press that, then they're able to use the keys, yay. But if you're in an iframe, like an editor, that actually doesn't count. You gotta press through to the actual frame and it's like, argh. So we um, created a pane that has a special thing in it. So here's the code. Let's talk more about it when we copy and paste that in there. So I copy that. This code's a little bit different in that it needs to go around the code that we have. So we're gonna put it way up at the top here and format the document. So here's our intro. It's a pane that has the content of a new label that says, welcome traveler, and we'll change the font later. Its background color is purple. And here's what you would need to turn on if you were in an iframe. So if you're in the editor, just uncomment that. And what that does is it's kind of a trick. It turns all the pointer events off on the canvas so that when you click on the, um, the pane, to close it or click anywhere to close it. You're not actually clicking on the canvas, you're clicking through to the iframe and we capture that event on the iframe and uh, hide the pane and then give the pointer events back to the canvas. But anyway, we don't wanna do that if we're not in an iframe because uh, when you click through, it ends up activating the board. So anyway, for us in VS Code, we'll leave that commented out. We show the pane right here and this is a callback function that is going to be run when we close the pane. Okay, so you could put an arrow function in there if you wanted to, but we're going to call the function start game when we close the pane. So here's the function start game, and now all of the board code that we've made, all of this stuff we're supposed to put inside there. Or the other way to do it is take the end of the board game. So there's this function start game right there, which is gonna have all of this stuff in it, all of this stuff would be tabbed in, the tab and then we end the start game down here. Okay, so this is each tab that we do is like a box. So what we did is we just made a function body that is like a box. So each of these brackets is like a box. This is here to here, this stuff's in the box. That's why we indent it. This stuff is here to here, everything that's inside there, blah, 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 which is a lot, is inside that box. It's tabbed in one. Okay, so you should keep your tabbing. Or if you want, you can hit format document, which I don't need because I did the tabbing, but that will make your tabbing for you. Okay, so there's our function start game. And all of that stuff that we had before is inside the function start game. And if we save it and try it out here, brum, 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 we should now see a pane at the beginning. Welcome clever traveler. And we need to get that font going, but there should be. And when I hit enter like that, click it, it, um, it shows that stuff. Yay. Oh, just thinking in that welcome. Did I put the no mouse in there? Uh, no. All right. So I forgot to update that on the example. Watch what happens. I can't click on the font. I can't click off the font. I can also clear it that way. But I can't click on the font. And that's because the 
the label in there is oops I went off the side of the font there the label in there is taking the mouse and there's nothing there's no event on it so we would we can go no mouse here I might actually change it so that content of the pane is not interactive by default but that can be confusing as well because if you wanted to interact with the content of the pane in any way you wouldn't be able to and you'd be wondering why can't I interact with it so anyway um we say hey no mouse on the label right there and then you get the following look I can see how even though it <laughs> says no mouse and then yet I appear to have my finger on there so it must be paying attention to the mouse but what's happening is it's ignoring the label and doing the same thing as it did on the pane which is clicking and going through so that's a better user experience all right great and that will give us key key presses which we don't have yet because we haven't added the key presses but we won't we wouldn't be able to get any key downs until we interact so the pane is the way that we do our interaction uh, same with sound we're not allowed to play sound uh, this isn't just zim this is all canvas frameworks and uh, actually it might be all html now i'm not sure but you can't play sound until the user interacts with the object so you can't get key presses until the user interacts because otherwise imagine that imagine i have a canvas thing on the page here and i'm listening to key presses i could read your you know typing in user uh, names and passwords and stuff like that so you've got to be have the focus for for that to to work and that's a safety issue Alrighty, great under the wall code add the following code that will make the player move all right so we're about to move yay look at that board dot add keys and uh we're sort of making it work with the arrows and we're saying don't add the keys for uh going to this don't add it for zeros and ones basically so in other words we can't go to zero and one if we said data zero and one then we could only go on zero and one but if we say not data zero one it's a filter for not those and here are all our filters basically data so an array of what the tiles must have not data an array that the tiles cannot have color an array that the tile must have this color or not this color must have this icon or not this icon must have this item or not this item must be this column or not this column must be this row or not this row okay so those are your filters and those can go into a lot of the methods um, for instance we can get a random uh, we can get a random tile and pass it a filter that random tile cannot have this or this random tile must have this okay isn't that neat all right um pathfinding so oh wait did we do this no let's grab that copy that and this is our key and so we'll take a look and see what that key is. so we're coming after the walls it says but still inside of our start game we are saying board.add keys player on the player arrows and so you could have a second player and do wasd for instance uh and then there's the not data all right let's see what that does bum 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 welcome clever traveler now i should already uh, have key and I, oh i start moving my key good look at that I, ah but i can't move anymore because i hit a lantern i hit a wall i can only go on these sort of uh great light gray squares okay isn't that cool so there's my character moving around yay uh, but we're not yet moving to wherever i press and we don't see the pathfinding stuff i wonder what could be next hmm pathfinding okay so for the pathfinding we're using a library called easy star and it uses a star pathfinding ai and we need this script right here so i'm copying that and that goes right up at the very top above the module script right here like so if you are in the editor uh, let's see do we have an editor open there's the editor you would need to log in uh, through this route right here go once you log in you get a file and oh i've cleared uh, right because we were just taking a look at that yeah so anyway you get a file 
and save your file, give it a name, a title, a description, and then additional scripts right here is you don't paste the whole thing, you just paste the name of the script right there. Okay, okay so the path to the script goes right here and then you would hit save and your file would then be using the easy star. Okay, so that's to, to complete this exercise in the editor, you need to log in, but that's a good, a good thing anyway. <laughs> It'd be nice if you saved your files and when you do, you get lists. So over on the left-hand side here, we have a bunch of lists that we keep. And so uh, we're doing a talk for a game challenge and this is the list that we're going to share with the game challenge. And those are the things in the list uh, so you got a bunch of files. You can keep, oh, well, you can keep your favorites without that. But there's all sorts of demo files here, basic demos. So it's nice to have a file system as well. All right, and there's videos about the editor, like how to use the editor and all the list stuff. You can share those lists if you're a teacher, for instance. Uh, there's videos about all that. Okay, so good. And where are we now? Make uh, we're kind of looking through this. We did that one. We won't tell any difference when we run it. Uh, hopefully, we won't get an error. But it, you know, there you go. Okay, so that talks you talks you through the editor stuff there as well. And um, Duke, Duke, Duke. so what else? Oh yeah. So here's the pathfinding. Uh, this is a lot of code. Like that, and we'll just go through it briefly. It's kind of code that you would use for any game with pathfinding. There's not much of a difference. The only thing is it's kind of right in here, but we'll uh, let's go in and put that in our code here. So below the keys, but still we're still inside of the end game. So always make sure you're inside the end game there. And right click and format document. Okay. So here's the pathfinding code, and we'll, we'll probably leave that at the bottom, so I'll kind of give us some space there. We'll leave it at the bottom as we add more. Like I said, we usually do this kind of pathfinding code in most of the games that we would make. So board uh, tiles dot tap. When we tap on the board, if the player is moving already, we're going to return. That means leave. If, um, if there's a path, then we're going to follow the path. So there's already a path. So if, if we have a path, the tap actually makes us follow the path. So we use board follow path. We say that player, please follow the path. And then we clear the path, set it to null. Otherwise we could be tapping on a mobile where we don't even have a path. So maybe we didn't even make a path yet. Uh, we then would want to get path, which gets the path to where we tapped and follows it once it's found. Okay, so two, two scenarios. One is we're on a computer and as we roll over, we get a path already. Uh, why recalculate it? Or if we don't have a path, then we calculate the path. The, here is the easy star stuff. So we're making AI and the acceptable tiles. So set the acceptable tiles. We can walk on anything with an X. So anything else we can't walk on. There's a variety of different ways. And what you should do is take a look at the ISO uh, example. That's what we were talking about right here. Take a look at the ISO example. If you wanna see how to go through things like um, water or, because water would be harder to walk through presumably, or sand or mountainous things. So uh, terrains, uh, that, that all would go right in here. What kind of terrains are you doing? And those calculations would go, you can assign number values of difficulty number values to it and look at the ISO example. And it's a few lines of code right in here. So when we change, uh, when the board changes, when we roll over the squares, if the player is moving, don't do anything, but otherwise get the path. So that's why as we roll over here, it keeps on changing the paths for us. All right, I lost it. As we roll over, oh, not yet. Uh, sorry, in the working example, is this the working example? As we roll over, whenever that change, that's a change, uh, the board is changing its, its um, square, then it gets the path and those little round rings are, are, are saying what, what path it is. Okay. It's 
the function get path, which is right here. That's what we're doing each time. Get path, and uh, we're dealing with, I haven't looked at this in a little while, uh, but we're dealing with some AI stuff. So this is the from the, the Pathfinder stuff. You don't really need to know what's going on here, but it's basically making sure that uh, it gets a path that goes from one place to another. Yay! Okay, and if the path is found, then it shows it. It uses a ticker to calculate as well. It needs time to calculate. You can't put it in a loop. So a ticker is how, how we animate. If you want to see something move, you don't put it in a loop normally. Although we do have a loop with an interval, but normally, you know, we we're talking a for loop or something like that, because that is so processor hungry that it happens all at once and doesn't show any updates. It's, it's for calculating. So uh, the, the um, AI, though, is different. It needs time in between its, its calculations. So you would throw that in a ticker. But anyway, like I said, you don't really need to know anything about what is in here. Yay! Right? You could almost collapse it. We could almost take it right into Zim, put it in the board and say, hey, this is you know how you make a path. Uh, the only thing is, that's called abstraction. We're abstracting it out from there and making it easy. You don't have to think about it. The only thing is this scenario right in here, we'd have to expose this and let you pass in parameters for it possibly. So maybe one day we'll bring that into Zim so you don't need to look at it. All right, big sigh. <gasps> oh, good. All right, that just got us through some code. Woohoo! All right, let's take a look at what's next then. Oh, let's save it. <laughs> See if it works. So we save that and come back here. And do we have our path? Is it working? Welcome, traveler. Hey, look at that. So there's our path stuff. Note that if we're on one of the lanterns, it doesn't go there. It's only once we go next to a lantern that does it go there. Does it work? It works. Our little character is moving. Oh, how cute is that? Oh, my gosh. Okay. And if there's already a path, it doesn't... Clicking doesn't do anything. Oops. Well, unless that path is gone, at which point it does. All right. Good. Yay. Wow. You want to stop there? Is that it? I made the game. My character moves. Oh, what wonder. All right. We got a, we got a bit more left, though. Okay. Lantern interaction. When a player is next to the lantern, the lantern can press the, uh, or sorry, the lantern can, you, the player, can press the lantern to reveal the orb. If it's not the right color in the sequence, the cover will go back on after a small time. If it is the right color, then we'll emit some stars. The orbs stay visible unless one of the next orbs revealed is the wrong color, at which point all of the previous visible orbs are going to be covered again. Clunk, clunk. Clunk. And that kind of helps you if you notice that clunk, clunk, clunk. It shows you the order in which uh, they were found, I believe. So it goes all the way back to the first orb found, which means you need to repeat that order, but going from the last one uh, forward. So it does uh, remind you of the order in which you found your last ones, if you pay attention to it. Okay, so the emitter. Here's a link out to the emitter tool. So this is the Zim emitter here. And you can make changes. If I press around, the emitter moves to, to where you're going. But you can make changes to what you see here. There's It's now emitting a bunch of squares. Here it's emitting triangles. There It's emitting stars, which is actually kind of what we want to do as well. And you can uh, turn it on so it's emitting them more slowly or randomly slow to fast. So now it's like blah, 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 blah. But if you sync these up, then they'll go at the same time. Uh, this is the number. So you can do like a whole bunch of them every time it emits um, and say how long they're going to. So now we're making them last longer. Here's the angles. So oh, if we put it to the same angle like that, we can have it kind of shoot out and add more force or no force blah, they just fall and then we could also do gravity oh we do negative gravity and positive gravity let's change those angles though okay so you get the idea is that's the emitter um, happening there and we uh, prepared our emitter right here let's grab this code and we can put it in and talk about it 
So we're preparing for a right answer right now when we click on the board. Yeah. Format document. Okay, so we're letting the number of orbs showing. So these would be the number that we've got right uh, to start at zero. We make the emitter. With the object that we're emitting is going to be a poly. This will do a, uh, this will do a star for us. So this is the radius. Here's the number of points it has. So here we're saying, hey, the radius is either going to be 20 or 30. We could put a min and a max in there. If we, did we show you a min and a max? We didn't. Probably should do that. Don't know why we didn't. A min of 20, comma a max of 30. So that gives us a radius between that, and that's another zim v value. We'll change that in the, it's a good idea to be able to see that. So uh, then seven to six, pick randomly between those two. Uh, this is the pointiness of it. We could randomize that as well. And here are the colors. Every time we emit, you see how that's handy. Every time we emit, it's going to pick from that stuff. Dynamic parameters. If you choose random numbers outside here, you might be thinking, why couldn't I just choose a random number? If you put a random number in here and send it in, it's going to pick something random, but then everything it emits is going to be that same random thing. <laughs> See what I mean? It's at the wrong place. We don't want to make the randoms beforehand. We want to do it inside as we're making each item. So that's why we needed to create dynamic parameters. And there's an, another example. All right, we've got a force and a gravity, and we're starting paused. If, if we don't start paused, then, and we, we have to put the emitter on the stage. So there we are centering, oh, I should put a comment there. There we are centering the emitter on the stage. And let's see what we got when we come back over here. This is what our emitter looks like. Okay, there it goes. But the emitter just keeps on emitting. We want to start it paused and then spurt the emitter. And we'll position it and spurt the emitter uh, later when we get a score. Okay, so that's the idea. Build the emitter once. When you need it, you put it somewhere and spurt it, like an explosion or something. However, if you're having a fire that's constantly going, then you just put it in the emitter and let it constantly go like this, where we have a fire of stars. Alrighty, so that's the emitter, which is really good for rewards and stuff, and you see that's pretty easy. Normally, you don't even have to do this. Uh, here's what a default emitter looked like. Okay, so comment that out. All we're doing is centering a default emitter. And there's the default emitter. Okay. See, if you want to emit something different, you can emit some text, whatever, and emit words. Anyway, that's what we're emitting. We don't want to center it, though. Uh, not yet. And we do want to start it paused. So start paused, true. Here's an array that we're keep, gonna keep track of correct items. So any correct ones we're putting in there because we wanna remember that because if we get it wrong, we have to go through all the previous correct ones and turn them off. So that allows us to loop through this array of correct items, turn them all off, and then clear the correct items. So we're probably gonna see that next. Let's have a look. So this gets this is our this is the crux of the game welcome here's here's the whole logic part the rest of it was you know some setup of moving about and getting a board there this is where we're actually doing the logic of well are we winning are we losing uh, you know, what's happening in our game so it gets a little tricky let's grab the code from here and put it in here <clears throat> okay, here we are. So when we tap on a tile, well, we could have, if we wanted to, this is zim tap, it's chainable. We could have also put an on click or on mouse down. So it could be board dot tiles dot on mouse down. Uh, note that we're saying tiles as opposed to the um, board itself, which has all the items as well. So if you say the tiles, it, um, it will get the right E, uh, the event object and stuff. So we use, did we use an E? Uh, we didn't even use an E. But 
well, whatever. Okay, so the board's current tile, that's what we used instead of e.target, I guess. Maybe it wouldn't make that much of a difference then. So const tile is equal to, one thing is if you press down a tree, the tree is on the board, the tree might be outside the board. So that tree right there is outside the board, so if I press there, what tile number would I have? So really I want the tiles themselves that I'm pressing on. Okay, board.current tile gets us whatever the current tile is. We could have tested to see if the board.get data of the tile, of the current tile, is one, that would be a lantern. Yay! But we actually want to get a reference to a lantern because we're going to be doing things. We're going to be hiding the cover of the lantern and putting an orb in it. So we did it this way instead. Board.get items, whatever is at the tile. And when you do get items, there might be more than one item on it. So at any time, uh, if we wanted to, we could have made this person go right on the orb. There could be several things here. There could be treasures and a scroll or something. So anytime you go to get the items that are on a, a tile, uh, it actually gives you an array. We know that we're only going to ever have one, so we ask for the zero element of that array. So that gets us, uh, that gets us our lantern. Okay, or possibly our lantern. It could get us, if there's no lantern, it might get us nothing. So now we're letting orb and we're saying, hey, if there is an item, so if there is something there, if there's an item, I'm going to say the orb is the item's orb. If there is an orb, so if I clicked on an item that doesn't have an orb, this is going to be undefined and I'm not even going to do it. So in other words, this is a test to basically say, am I on a lantern? Because only the lanterns have an orb property. And I'm asking, hey, if there's not an orb, dot or if the orb does not have a parent, that's a parent means it's been added to the, the lantern. Okay, uh, remember, if you recall, our orbs start off not added to the lantern. So up above here, here's our orb. It's a new orb, but we're, we have not added it to the lantern. We've put a property of the orb. It does have a property of that orb on the lantern, but we didn't add it to the lantern. There's adding the lantern or centering or positioning or loking. Anything on the lantern would have been, it, it's then a child of the lantern as an apparent child relationship but we did not add the orb yet. Okay, the orbs aren't there, only the covers. So down below here, that's what's happening here, is if it doesn't have a parent, if, if there is an orb, yeah, this lantern's got an orb, but it's not been added to the lantern yet, then we're, this is what we want. This is a lantern without the orb showing. Yay! We want, basically, when we press on this, we want a lantern without the orb showing. Oh, I can't press on that until I get near it. There we go. Okay, so now it has an orb. The orb is in an, an, a lantern, but before we did that, it didn't have the orb yet in there. Okay, uh, next. This is kind of cool. So we know we've pressed on a lantern that doesn't have its orb showing. Check this out. Board.get tiles around our current tile. So we pressed on a lantern. This will get all of the tiles around the lantern. So if I, oh, I got I got it right. <laughs> so lantern didn't come back. Okay, so when I press on this lantern, like that, it just got all of the tiles around the lantern. Actually, if I press on any lantern right here, it gets all of these tiles. And basically we wanna find out if the player is there. So when I press on these lanterns, the player is not around the, the lantern. If I press on this lantern, the player is one of these tiles around. So that's why the lantern opened. We don't want to open the lantern unless the player is on one of the tiles around. So isn't that neat? We've actually got a method called get tiles around because we often want to know, are we next to something? And this is how you can find that out. Now we're looping through. That gives us an array of all of the tiles around. We're looping through that. <laughs> we're looping through that each time we get the tile. And if the tile is equal to the player's board tile. So any, any um, item that is on the board 
has a board tile, and that gets a reference to the tile that the, that the item is on. So if basically the player is on one of these things, then the player is there and reveal the orb. So we are taking the cover and removing it from the lantern. We're taking the orb and we're centering it. Uh, on, oh, the item is the lantern. So we're centering it on the item. And then we're updating the stage so that we can see that there. Don't know, we might, depending on what we're doing in here, we might not need to update the stage, but that's the idea. If there's a player there, we're going to show it. Over here, we're going to test the color. So we have just revealed the orb, yay. But now we have to find out, is it the right color? So if the item's orb color, so if the color of the orb is equal to the target, the target is that set of things down there at the bottom. Do I still have the, oh, I still have the emitter going, sorry about that. Yeah, that's what I laughed at before. I've got this stupid emitter going in my other screen. Kept on. Uh, getting in my way. But anyway, this is the target right here. And so we're going to try and find out whatever number we're on. If we're on number zero, it would be the color of that. If we're on number one, it's color of that. Are we? So whichever level we're at, kind of, that's what color we're going to get. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of that emitter so I can think. All right. So the target dot items is all of the um, the items in that tile. And num is what we're using to figure out what la level we're on. I don't know what you want to call that. Level is not exactly right, but that's how many orbs are currently showing, we'll call it. All right, so zero is currently showing. Basically, when we do get one showing, we're going to want to increase the number so that the next time we check it, the number is one bigger. Anyway, we ask for that tile uh, elements color. And if they're the same, then we're good. Then we have the right answer. If they're wrong, if it's not the same, these are not equal. Note the double equal as well in JavaScript. We'll use double equal for a comparison operator, not a single equal sign. That's an assignment. So if it's double equal, uh, it's good. Otherwise, it's the wrong answer. So we've tried to, we're going to explain this, um, the, the sort of logic to get a right answer, a wrong answer. And then we put what we do when there's a right answer in this function. We put what we do when there's a wrong answer in that function. When I first coded that, I didn't bother. I, I just put all the right stuff there and I put all the wrong stuff there. But it can, because we don't need to run that function more than once, so we can just put it all in here and it's fine. Often we'll use functions if we need to run the code more than once. But another time that we would use functions is just for organization and it does help. So now this becomes a little bit simpler looking. It's already complicated enough, okay? but at least it doesn't have a bunch of code in there and a bunch of code in here. So this sort of simplifies it by separating out those into right answer stuff, wrong answer stuff. Each time we're passing in the item. So which item are we currently on? Because inside here, inside this tapping, this is where we know what the item is. We don't actually know what the item is outside anywhere. So if we have a different function outside here, we would have to pass the item through. So we're passing it as a parameter, telling it, hey, here's the item that is the right answer. Here's the item that is the wrong answer. Okay. And our next steps that we'll go through are, oh, what do we do when we're wrong? What do we do when we're right? Uh, I'm not sure which order we do it. I think we do the wrong first. Let's go have a look. Hopefully you guys are doing all right. Or is it time for another cookie? Well, we can't have too many cookies. How are we doing for uh, time? We're at over an hour now. We're coming along. Let's uh, go back to which one? This one? Nope, that one. And see what's next. The wrong answer. Ah, here's the stuff that we do when we have a wrong answer. So we can take the middle of that or all of this and replace the wrong answer with that. Wrong answer. Format document. All right, so the wrong answer, wait a little bit. Wait, so this is Zim timeout. Wait 1.5 seconds. So Zim timeout is in seconds. And then call this function. Uh, the other thing is we often do things like, hey, we've got this event. What type of event? It's a click. Call this function. We're going to loop 10 times. Call this function. Uh, four, so anyway, it often works that way. Yet the JavaScript timeout is the other way around where you put the time at the end and I always forget to put the time. Time's also in milliseconds. So this is just 
a Zim version of uh, the set timeout. We also have a, a Zim version of a set interval, which is really cool because that's just called interval. And you put the time first in that. And if you put a time with a Zim V value, those are those dynamic parameters, you can make the interval run at a series of times. Imagine playing musical notes or something. You can make the interval run at random times with a min and a max. And that way, when you have a, a falling game, which we're going to see in another tutorial, uh, those dynamic parameters work out really handy. All right, so in this case, we got a wrong item. We're setting a time out, and then we're putting the cover back on. We're removing the orb. We're also looping through each of the correct items. So the previously correct items, because we got to hide those all again. Aw. And we are then doing this to it. We receive that item, and we're adding its cover. We're removing it and updating the stage at that time. We've set the reverse to true. So we, when we created the each right item, we're putting it in the array. We haven't seen that yet because that happens in the, the right answer right here. Um, we'll put them in the array in the order that we find them. So we're now reversing that. We're setting an interval. So loops, uh, this is fairly new in Zim, a few versions ago. Uh, normally loops would happen instantly and we wouldn't be able to sort of see them uh, take time to, to close. But here we've added an interval and we've said the immediate false. So don't, don't make the first one go right away because uh, the default is make the first one go right away. However, these are all the other ones. We've already turned the current one off and now we want to wait 0.5 before we go to the other ones. And when you're complete, so when that is when it happens, when it's done, we're going to set our number back to zero, oh, starting again, and clear our correct items array. Yay. All right. So that's what we do when we have a wrong answer. What do we do when we have a right answer? That's right here. Copy. And put it right over top of the, the right answer. And format. So if we have a right answer, we take the emitter that is currently paused, we loc it at the item. Isn't that nice? Loc does an X and Y usually, 100, 100, would locate it at position 100, 100, the registration point. Uh, that's the difference, by the way, between a registration point, uh, or sorry, the loc and the pose. The pose positions the edges of the objects around the edges of the stage, whereas loc positions the registration point of the object at an X and Y. So anyway, there's uh, X and Y of 100, but uh, what's cool about loc is if you have an object that has an X and Y, you can just loc it at that object. And so we want to loc it at the item, like so. Although we are moving it down a bit. <laughs> so we found when we located at the item, it was still up a little bit high, so we moved it down. That's a relative movement. Zero in the X and down is, um, up is positive and down is negative. Is that how it goes? No. No, it's wrong. Uh, yeah, up is up is negative, so that's moving it up. Okay, spurt. And then we tell the emitter to spurt mm, 16 times. So that's 16 stars. We could randomly or put, put a random number in there if we wanted to as well. And add the item to the correct items. So this is our array that's storing which items are correct. Increase our number. Okay. And if we're at the end, so if the length of the correct items is equal to the colors of that length, that's how many orbs we have. If, uh, if we've got the same number of correct items, then we're done. We've, we've solved it. So wait just a little bit. Uh, let them see that final orb. And then we're adding our final pane there. The pane. You shall pass. Yay. Uh, we haven't set a font on it yet. And we're showing it, and when we close that pane, so we're showing the final pane, when we close it, we're reloading the page. That's a nice, easy way to restart the game. The pane also will have a style of a backdrop color of that and a line of center. Uh, this is Zim style, as far as we know. We're the only, only framework library that has style on the canvas. You can style the canvas itself with CSS, but you can't style things within the canvas. Zim can, and that's pretty cool. So uh, check that out. All right, um, there we go. That's what we do when we're right. Let's see if it works. Let's try out this right answer, wrong answer thing. And 
we come back here. There's <laughs> a particle emitter again. I think that, isn't that fixed now? It looks like it's fixed. Okay, so we come to here. We've got to go next to one of these things and we press it. It's the wrong one, so it goes back. We come to this one. Hopefully it will be blue. We haven't been very lucky lately. Have we? <laughs> Every time we tried in this tutorial, we got to the very end. Oh, there we go. We got lucky. And look, the emitter worked. Cool. What if we go back to this one? I, I can't remember what color was this one. Red. Darn. And both of them close. And you see that little timeout. So now we have to come back to this one. Let's let's try and get them right a little bit. Uh, do you remember where the green was? Have we seen the green yet? Yay! Two of them right. Note they didn't close. And pop on out to this one and see if both of those close or, or whatever. Maybe we'll get lucky. Uh, okay. Close, close. So you see how that one closed? And then this one? That means we go this one first, then that one, then not that one. Some other one. All right. It appears to be working. Yay. That is the end of the game. So a timer. All right, we got a few things. We got a timer. And let's grab that code. This is going to go up in the top right hand corner right there. <laughs> nice. All right, there's our timer. This comes from the game module. We're going to be counting down. Usually a timer Oh, we're not going to be counting down. Usually a timer counts down. It starts at 60, 60, 59, 58. But this one, we're going to be going from zero and going up. So down is false, setting is color, background color, and isometric. So the timer is built with isometric in mind. Uh, but I uh, have to... Um, okay, so where are we? Here we are. Did I save that? Yeah. And we refresh here. Oh, I don't see the timer. Save, ISO, refresh. Welcome, there it is. It must not have refreshed or something. So, welcome, clever traveler. There she be, right there, the timer counting up. And the ISO sort of aligns it with this side of the board. There's also an ISO left, and you could have put it over here. We're going to put the logo of the game over there. Nice, huh? All right, what's next? The right answer function. Oh, okay, so once we have a timer, we when we get it right, we want to stop the timer. And we also want to pass the timer into the message right there. So let's grab that. And it's just an adjust in the right answer. Right here. And where was it? I believe it's right here. Did the style come with that? Style as well. Okay. Timeout come up? Yeah, timeout as well. Okay, so we'll do that. There we go. And refresh. So watch yourself cutting and pasting that in there. Format. Oh, what did I just do? Change all occurrences. <laughs> Format document. All right, what we did is we added a stop. So when we end the challenge, we haven't seen the end of the challenge, we stop the timer. And that pane that was there, we added in, we concatenated on, we did it. Backslash N means a new line. So you shall not pass. And then on the next line, time is whatever the timer's time property is. Okay, and that will put the, the answer in there. Do we have a picture of that? No. Okay, we just talked about a leaderboard. Um, all right, so we do have a leaderboard. Instead of just telling the user the time, they you could add it and go right to here, to a leaderboard. And if they got a time that was better than, or less, I guess, for time, if it was less than other people, they would get on the leaderboard. Uh, and this is built into Zim, and you can use it as well. Um, it has a, it, it, We have server code to handle this as a and a database, but you can request. So there's a link here to the leaderboard. You can request to get in on that system and have it work for you as well. All right, so that's our Zong 2 leaderboard. That's what it looks like. And we've used that in a bunch of other games as well, all our alone droid games, 
uh, and our, our store games and so forth. So you can use that too and check out how to do that. We're not going to use the leaderboard though in this game. So final touches. We're on our final touches, which is good because I was kind of hoping to do this in an hour and a half. That gives us five minutes. <laughs> not bad, huh? All right, so our final touches. We've got to bring in the images. And one thing, when we're working in the editor, it will be fine. Uh, if we're working, uh, sorry, in the Zim editor, it will be fine because that's on a server. But if we're working locally, there's a thing called cores errors. And it's on any Canvas framework, uh, 3.js, etc. If um, you're viewing things locally, they don't like you loading images and sounds because that could uh, bring viruses in or whatever. But we don't need to worry about that. It's just sort of protecting the general public. Hey, download this HTML file. <laughs> it's got a canvas thing in it and it's going to do this. Um, but we're fine. We know what we're doing. We're working on our own code. We haven't put any bugs on our own code, I don't think. So uh, all is good there. So there's a couple options. You can use live server, first of all, because then you're... So live server is a, an extension over here called uh, live server right there. And I right click and I open with live server right here. And then it's uh, opening up in live server. Here it comes. Should be faster than that usually. So that's our... What's going on with my live server? I don't know why my live server is taking a while, but that's live server and it will open up fine there. It has every every other time I've ever done it. <laughs> uh, so that's live server. Or if you're going to use it through um, just the, the default browser right here, then you need to open up your Chrome. I'm going to do a little, little mini desktop reveal here. Don't worry. Little mini desktop reveal, there's my Chrome icon. And when I right click on the Chrome icon and choose properties, okay. right there, it's really small. We've got allow file access from files right there. It's a flag after the chrome.exe. So right there, I've added that. So if I wanna run local files on the canvas, I just add that, I open my Chrome from, from this icon right here, uh, which, uh, did. You can find out about that by following these instructions right here. So I clicked on the button and there's a security error that mentions cores. This is on the Zim tips. And here's what you would do on Chrome. You do that. You add allow file access from files to your exe. On Mac Chrome you do that. On Safari you do that. On Firefox you do that. So that uh, is the tips on how you can view images on the canvas when you're testing locally. As soon as you put this on a server, it's no problem. It's it's only testing locally your images. And like I said, it's not a Zim thing. It's on a, everybody has this issue. All right, so here's our assets. Uh, the other issue with assets is it's gonna be slightly different between the editor and the VS code. So here it is in the VS code. Let me copy this, copy. And I'll show you in VS code and then we'll show you in the editor. So in VS Code, we just did the frame stuff right here. So in the paste. This was our old frame call where we had the color and calling the ready function. Here's our new frame call. Everything's the same except we're the next parameter is what assets do we want to pass in and what path are they available. And we've prepared our assets right here. We're going to grab person.png, lantern.png, and this Google font right there. That's short for Google font. It's a shortcut that we can use to grab any Google font with an underscore there. So go out and look at the Google fonts. That happens to be one. So those are our assets. We could have sounds as well. We don't have any sounds in this one, but in other tutorials, we'll, we'll bring in some sounds as well. And here's the path that they're going to. Often we would put that in our own local path, like assets, just like that in the same folder. But uh, here we're bringing them in from Zim. Okay, and we don't need this frame call right here. So there we go. And now we will have our assets available. We can do a test on that. That one's called person.png. Why don't we go down to the bottom-ish here and I'll just show you 
uh, new pick. So here's how you would bring in a pick person.png.center. And if I save that up and view over here in the default browser, locate that. Is that it? Yep. Refresh. Oh, okay. So our person has now shown up. Okay. It's too big, so we're going to have to scale that person down to make it fit on the board there. But that's the image in there. It's not hooked up at all. It's still the old player is. Okay, but that's how you bring in a picture. How you bring in a sound, if you had a sound, is new odd. And this would be, I don't know, scream. <laughs> dot mp3 for instance or a wave or whatever and then you could play it dot play oh with a y and the parameter in there is volume then is it looping and stuff like that you can't play a sound until you've interacted though so you shouldn't shouldn't do that also if you're going to scream 10 times don't make a new odd each time go something like const scream is equal to a new odd and then somewhere else when you're playing it 10 times you would scream here and you would scream again and you would scream again etc so that you've made one play one object one sound object and then just play it anytime you want to okay so that's the general idea about assets and once again we would do that in the frame call well in the editor we don't have a frame call so here's our editor uh, because the frame is up above already. So in a frame, we would do bring in the code that we had here. Uh, that's how you would set the frame color to black, by the way. I don't know if we saw that, but I'm going to grab that. And I'll grab all of it, I suppose. Uh, okay, so that would make a frame color of black. If I do a test here, there it is, black. Here's an asset called person. So this is the same thing, basically. The path is the same thing. But we're using the frame, frame, F for frame, frame.load assets and passing in the assets, passing in the path. By the way, the next thing, if you have a lot of these things, you can make a new waiter like that. And that gives you three little dots. If you do a new progress bar, you get a progress bar, like a ring that fills up or a bar that fills up depending on, on what you want. Okay, so that's if you have a lot of assets, you might wanna do that as the next parameter in there or in the frame call, it's also the next parameter in the frame call. So now that you've loaded those assets, you get an event, a complete event, and you would put all your code in the complete event. For instance, uh, new lantern, or new pick, sorry, <laughs> quote lantern.png.center. And there it is. Okay, so once they've loaded, we do have lazy loading as well. And lazy loading lets you load it without um, doing the complete events and stuff, but it actually does those in the background for each one that you lazy load. So it's better to be more professional if you just do them all at once like this. There's also some things that lazy loading won't work with, such as sprites uh, and, and tiling something you need dimensions but you can pass in the dimensions in here if you're lazy loading but then you know like it's why bother all right so we'll we'll leave it at that yay <laughs> okay so great we've got our images now we want to actually bring in our person so this is what we had before const player equals a new person and instead of that we're going to put in this person code right here and so let's do that Where was our person? There's the player. So instead of const player equals person, I'm replacing it with this person code, which is saying, hey, we're going to grab this pick that is the person picture. We're making a player container that is the same width and height as that pick. And then we are uh, center regging, or we're setting the registration points in the center of that and setting its height that will put it into the onto the board nicely and scaling it down because we said that person was too big so question is why did we we could have put the pick and just scaled the pick and set its reg and we not even had a container so why did we do that and then we're pick dot center reg on the player okay we're taking the pick and putting it in the player which is the container 
The reason for that, it's kind of an important reason. Let's see if it works first though. Save that, just give you a break. And we'll see a picture <laughs> we're talking about too much more code. Oh, look at that. We have a clever traveler there. All right, nice, huh? So there's our person, nicely scaled and with the registration point that places it on the square nicely. A little bit of experimenting going on with that, but not, it wasn't too bad. The reason we put it into a container though is I don't know if you've noticed, but when things get close, so I'm going to bring this this guy right here closer. Look at how tall it is. That's taller. That's like more than my cursor tall versus if I go back here, it's going farther back and now it's smaller. Um, so smaller. Okay. So in other words, we're already scaling the person as it's coming closer and going back. So that would change the scale in both the X and the Y. Well, we're wanting to flip the player. So it kind of looks awkward sometimes if the player starts moving backwards. And I'm not sure when... You see how I'm kind of the player's walking backwards now and it's not looking? <laughs> so we're, we're going to flip it. It kind of helps. At least it's just going sideways. The uh, best solution would be to make have a picture of the back of the player and swap it in the container. So that's another reason for having a container. If you had multiple pictures for the sprite, a left picture, a right picture, a, a hitting picture, a digging picture, <laughs> a going backwards picture. All right, if you had all those pictures or sprites, and sprites are little animations of those. If we have a single container, then we can keep on replacing the right picture into that container. And yet we only have the player object, the player objects that container. And that's handy because we compare things to the player object. We move it. We do all sorts of things to the player. And rather than have different objects, have a container then we have the same object all the time. And in the container, we put the different pictures. So that's one reason if you have different pictures. In our case, we're going to be flipping it. And to flip something, we actually use the scale X. We set the scale X to negative one and it flips it. <laughs> all right, so why don't I show you what that looks like right now, just in case you can't visualize it. So here we're moving the, the player around. And uh, let's get it to, tr oh, there, it just flipped. Did you see it? So move it back to here. You see how it flips? Okay, so that's, uh, and note the arm. If you note the arm, the arm's holding something and it's holding it in the left hand when it flips. <laughs> it's holding it in the right. Oh, no, wait a minute, holding it in the left hand. How did it do that? Hold it, holding it in the right hand. So that's it's holding in the right hand. Here it is holding it in the left hand. So uh, it doesn't quite work if you're holding something. <laughs> Whatever, I don't think we'll notice. Um, but anyway, that's us flipping. And to do that, we're flipping the scale X. And so we can't we can't just have the, the picture there because the picture is growing. As we're moving closer, it grows with scale. And we're flipping, it, it's changing the scale. So that, that gets all messed up. So if you put it in a container, we can flip the picture in the container and scale the container. So we flip the scale X on the picture inside and use the scale for the um, positioning on the, or the depth on the, on the container. Yay. All right, good. So we got that in there. Let's go to the next thing. Sorry, that was kind of belabored, wasn't it? You doing okay though? <laughs> I, think, I think we just broke our hour and a half though. Yep, yep, we did. All right, but flipping's kind of, you know, it's sort of important, that concept of the container. For the keys, so here's what's going to do the flipping right here. We put this underneath the keys. So we already have the key code. Let's uh, go and put this underneath the key code. And this is how we're doing the flipping. <laughs> it's always so messy. All right. When we key down or if we're, if we're starting to move. So when the player has a, a starting move uh, event, that comes from the board. And then when the frame is doing a key down, if the key is a right arrow or an up arrow, we're changing the scale to a negative one. And if it's a, a left arrow or a down arrow, we're putting it back to one. And same with the moving. If we're going right or up, we go negative one. If we're going left or down, we go one. All right, yay. Let's see if this flips now. Welcome traveler, and I come in. I think it was flipping in the corner for us. Oh, it flipped right there. Good, it is flipping. Uh, yeah, there's a flip. 
Okay. And that way, uh, we had a problem before when we came down here. It's, it's kind of going sideways. <laughs> At least it's not going totally backwards. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little, that one's nice going forwards. And this one kind of goes sideways. <laughs> but At least it's not totally backwards. Um, well, it should be totally backwards. Um, okay. So what have we got? Uh, back to our logos and fonts. The logo that we brought in is called Macondo Swash Caps. And we want to put that anywhere we put a null. So there's where we were talking about orbs. We used to have a null there. Here, again, we had a null there. And also in our labels of our panes, we want to put that in there as well. So we got most of the code there for that. But I think we can just probably do a search for null, Control F, null. And it will find those faster, I believe. So there's a null there. Oh, uh, in quotes, though. And note that we don't put GF there. So when we loaded it in, we put GF for Google font. But when we actually use the font, we just use the font name. And where's another null? Path null. OK, that's not the right null. That's not the right null. Not the right null. There's a, there's a good null for us. And any others? Yeah, there's one. And was there one more? Okay. That was in the pathfinding. We don't care. We got that one. I think that was it then. What about our very first logo? Do we have that? Do we put? We haven't. We don't even have. Ah, that's why. We don't even have a first logo yet. Okay. So was that uh, out in the instructions to get that first logo? Yeah. Add the title at the start of the game, right there. New label, orbs of order. All right, so we're copying that. And it doesn't really matter where we put it exactly, but we'll put it right here at the start of the game. So orbs of order, 70 size, that font, purple, and we're locating it in the top left corner. All righty, so you ready? Our, our pane now has the new font. Looks nice, huh? I like that little curl on it. Uh, fonts are important. Don't don't always use system fonts, especially if you've got free Google fonts to use. Very easy. Although we've always had free fonts, but you can download any free fonts from font systems and stuff and put it in the same directory and load in the font as an asset. Or you can use Google fonts. All right. Enter. There's the orbs of order. Nice. And here's the to pass. So all that stuff's coming in. We didn't see the conclusion pane, but that's fine. All right. Good, 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 good. Lantern image, last thing. Think. Here it is. We had just put in a rectangle before, but now we want a cover that is a picture of the lantern. And then there's the conclusion. So we're nearly there. So a picture of the lantern. Where was that? There it is. Here's the cover, a new rectangle. Uh, we don't really need that. There we go. Okay, and there's our picture of a lantern coming in. And that's what is going to go inside the container and start off. And look, uh, there we go. That's what we've got so far. Refresh. Welcome, clever traveler. Oh, doesn't that look nice? All of a sudden it looks done. <laughs> we, went from, we went from not done to done. Bang! There we go. Let's see if it works. Go to, I always go to this lantern first. Green. Oh, it's the last. Let me go to that one. Maybe I should always go to this lantern first. Yellow. <laughs> Doing them in reverse order. All right. Well, whatever. There's the game. The orbs. Of, the orbs of order. Uh, hopefully, you've been uh, been liking this. Um, took a little while, didn't it? But uh, not bad, huh? Uh, let's go take a look at the conclusion here. So, in conclusion. We find this very magical, and we hope you do too. Uh, we've made many more games, and so if you press this, it goes to the examples in Zim. Some of these examples are just the latest stuff that's been happening in Zim. We have shaders that we introduced. We have putting 2D interaction in, in 3D. Uh, you want to see a little bit of that? Like, check this out. So uh, 
we have a puzzle. So this is 3D right here, and this is Zim on the 3D. Isn't that cool? So uh, that's just new a few things. So some of them are newest things, but then we have more complete examples. So other other games in here, the Alone Droid series. There's the isometric board thing. We've got pens, etc. Then we have collections of stuff. So these are different collections of particle emitter collections, Zim beads. We have uh, interactive NFTs. That was a phase, <laughs> I guess we'll call it. Uh, and then a whole bunch of code pen examples. All right, so tons, tons of examples are available for you. We have so much fun building them. We have a beautiful forum and Discord channel. But, you know, come in. We'd love to hear from you. A lot of people join Discord or the forums and don't say anything. Come on in, ask questions, say things. We'd be happy to help. And there's all sorts of more features as well. So if you go to that one, this is the Zim About, and it has um, about the site a little bit. Uh, the vision statement of Zim, code creativity. We have code creativity, like Duo and V that we talked about, so that you can code creativity more easily. And then here's a bunch of features. So lots and lots of features and why we would use Zim. We can make these kinds of things. Uh, these were the different versions of Zim going back through time. Okay, uh, so there's lots of more features and we hope to keep on doing these tutorial series. We've done lots of videos as well, bubbling videos, explore videos where we explore code, but we haven't, and we've done code in five minutes series. So if you go out to Zim, um, probably the best place, well, you might be finding this is through the... Uh, if you go to the gold bars down here, sorry, I won't scroll the way. Gold bars. And then there's the vids right here. You may have come in through... In order. Uh, so we call that. On. You may have come in through here. I'm not sure. But we've got the Code in 5 Minutes series right here where we built a bunch of things. Like there's 50 of them in here or something like that. In 5 minutes. But we haven't done any... Uh, longer tutorials of building. We've done a lot of uh, the Zim Explorers are longer videos going through existing code and stuff. Some of those might be games. But now we're starting this specific tutorial thing uh, and we're starting with four, four different games and then maybe we'll do more tutorials where we match them up. Uh, we match them up with the... Uh, did I lose it? Right. We're matching it up with the Medium articles as well. All right, and I am Dr. Abstract, this little fellow here. Uh, all the best. Have a great um, day or night, depending on what you're doing. And this has been uh, the first of the All You Need series. All you need to make an HTML5 game, uh, an isometric game in this case. And we'll do a few more types of games in the future, so look for those as well. Cheers. Uh, join us in the forum, if you would. Uh, forum.zimjs.com. Ciao.